Hello everyone, and welcome to May Moa Madness! This is the first in my series of videos about Moa, one per week for the entirety of May. Why? Because May Moa Madness! For anyone not up to speed, Moa were a group of flightless birds that lived in Aotearoa, New Zealand until only around 600 years ago due to overhunting from Maori people shortly after their colonisation of the formerly human-free islands. They are the only group of birds to completely lose their wings entirely, not even having vestigial wing bones. And they varied in size from around the size of a turkey in the case of the bush mower to around 3.6 metres tall in the case of the North and South Island giant mowers in the genus Dinornis. But something that I wondered about when I was asked to make this video was where did the ancestors of mower come from and how long ago did they first evolve? Now, Moa belonged to a group of birds called the Paleognaths, also called the Ratites, which includes all of the big flightless birds we see today. Well, apart from big penguins, but anyway. Now, you might think, given the very similar appearance of the vast majority of modern Paleognaths, that they are all descended from a single flightless common ancestor, especially since they are all one another's closest relatives with one exception. But genetic and phylogenetic analyses of Paleognaths found that the Tinamous, a group of small, still-flying birds, once thought to be the closest relative of the Paleognaths, are actually a type of Paleognath themselves and are nested quite deeply within the group. That can only mean that multiple lineages of closely related birds within this group all independently became flightless and evolved to fill the same kinds of niches in different parts of the world. Specific work on the bush mower's genome conducted in 2014 found that moa are actually more closely related to tinamous than they are to any of the flightless paleognaths, meaning that they became flightless independently from any of the other paleognath lineages. And when I say all of them, I even mean including the only other type of paleognath in New Zealand, the kiwi, which is more closely related to the Madagascan elephant bird and means that at at least two separate flying paleognath lineages independently became flightless in New Zealand. Now, all of the nine currently recognized moa species come from rocks or sediments that are less than 2.5 million years old, and much are much younger than that. So you might be forgiven for thinking that moa only evolved within the past two and a half million years, but no. The second oldest fossil evidence we have of Moa comes from sediments dated to approximately 3.5 to 2.8 million years ago in the Maniatoto conglomerate formation of the Kyburn River in the southern South Island. The exposure shows one walking track of five footprints of an individual estimated to have weighed around 84 kilograms, which was walking along a silty bank in an otherwise braided river system. Interestingly, a single much larger print believed to have probably been produced by a giant mower of the genus Dinornis was also present between two footprints in this trackway. But these are not the oldest evidence for moa. The oldest moa fossils massively predate these and were described in 2009. These fossils come from the St. Baffin's fauna of the Bannockburn Formation, which has been dated to the latter part of the early Miocene around 19 to 16 million years ago on the basis of radiometric techniques, and is thought to represent a recovery from the controversial and often debated Oligocene drowning event. Unfortunately, we can't say much about the animals that these fossils came from. Oh wait, hang on! I haven't talked about the Oligocene drowning event! Uh, I can't talk about these fossils without first telling you about the Oligocene drowning event. Now, the Oligocene drowning is an interval which occurred during the Waitakian stage in New Zealand geology, which is between 25 and 21.9 million years ago. 
Basically all of Aotearoa New Zealand's rocks during this stage are marine in origin, and in 2001, geologists Dr. Hamish Campbell and Chuck Landis proposed that the entire landmass had sunk below the sea during this interval, before being uplifted again by the area's active tectonics. If this theory is correct, it would mean that all life on Aotearoa New Zealand must have got here in the last 21.7 million years, rather than having been present on New Zealand since it split from the rest of Gondwana. If this is correct, then Moa could only have existed since the drowning. But there's reason to think that this theory isn't correct, as reviewed by Dr. George Gibbs in his excellent book The Ghosts of Gondwana, which you should all read, it covers a lot of the scientific literature and it's just a really fascinating book. Firstly, many of the Waitakian aged marine limestones at a site called Cozy Dell contain an awful lot of terrestrial pollen, indicating over 100 plant species were present nearby and there were fragments from at least 13 plant species also present in these rocks. Gibbs also talks about a number of studies which looked into the trees from New Zealand, notably the genus Agalthus and Metrosideros. Both of these genera have fossil records which predate the Oligocene drowning and are present in Aotearoa New Zealand, but genetics and biogeographic studies indicate that the groups radiated out from New Zealand, with the most basal members of these genera being the ones present on New Zealand today. So in any case, whilst it certainly looks like the entirety of New Zealand was not underwater during this interval, at least a significant portion of the country definitely was, probably a large majority of it and a lot of organisms in New Zealand do seem to have undergone a genetic bottleneck because of it. So, did Moa first evolve before or after the Oligocene drowning? As Tennyson et al. discuss, if they arrived after the drowning, then we can assume that their ancestors flew to New Zealand across the seas, but if not, there's the possibility that they were already flightless by the time Aotearoa separated from Gondwana, or that they were already present on Aotearoa. We'll get back to that later. First, let's talk about what those oldest Moa fossils I started talking about earlier actually were. Well, they are six bone fragments and 154 pieces of big, thick eggshell that are thought to probably be from a moa, with the eggshells having the same slit-covered surface texture when viewed under a scanning electron microscope, as is seen in the eggs of, of other large paleognaths, such as rhea, elephant birds, and, more importantly, recent moa. In fact, the total combination of features between each layer of the eggshell only match that of recent moa species, all but confirming that these ancient remains do come from ancient moa. As Tennyson et al. note, shell thickness seems to correlate with adult bird size in more recent moa, and one of their eggshell pieces, which bears all the hallmarks of being a moa egg, was very much thicker than the rest. They assume on this basis that their thickest eggshell piece belonged to a very large species comparable with the recent giant moa, whilst all of the others belong to smaller but still sizable birds. What these findings demonstrate is that if the moa did arrive in Aotearoa New Zealand after the Oligocene drowning, then they got large very, very fast. And here's where things get interesting because we actually have even older fossil evidence to suggest that moa were present in New Zealand before that. This evidence comes in the form of a fossil shrub. Now, if you, like I often do, ever bash around in a New Zealand forest, or really anywhere in New Zealand, you'll find tons of species of shrub with very wide-angled, divaricating, tightly bound stems and very small round leaves. This growth form has convergently evolved a whole bunch of times in different plant lineages here, to the extent that a lot of them are a nightmare to even tell apart. And this growth pattern is believed to have evolved to make plants harder to eat by grazers with a beak, i.e. harder to eat by mower. 
And this fossil plant, which the authors suspect to belong to the still-living genus Raukawa, uh, here's an example that I found that looks frankly just like this specimen, has that exact same divaricating morphology. So, this plant, which was found in sediments dated to around 20 million years ago, indicates that moa were present at least 20 million years ago, and seem to have been present in Aotearoa, New Zealand, for at least long enough to have significantly influenced plant evolution by this point. So, how long ago did they appear? Well, one way to try to answer this is to model the timeline of species divergence in MOA using a molecular clock analysis of mitochondrial DNA to calculate when species split. And one study in 2009 by Professor Michael Bunsen colleagues gave us some cool and interesting insights. In their study, which used mitochondrial DNA from 263 specimens from across New Zealand, combined with late Cenozoic paleogeographic models, they traced the ancestry of the recent Moa lineages, finding that Megalopteryx split from the ancestor of all other Moa around 5.8 million years ago, with all other Moa lineages diverging from a common ancestor within the last 5.8 million years, and most within the last 3 or 4 million years. Now, Bunts and colleagues suggest that this is the result of only one MOA species and one continuous anagenic MOA lineage existing from the Oligocene drowning event until around 5 million years ago, and that at this point the lineage underwent a significant amount of speciation more recently due to the uplift of the Southern Alps in the last 8.5 to 5 million years, with the Alps creating both barriers for migration between populations as well as resulting in differences in climate in different parts of the country due to the Alps blocking the westerly circumpolar winds, creating rainforests in the west of the South Island and drier, warmer climates in the east. This would have completely changed the ecosystem and led to the creation of a lot of new habitat types, including tussock lands and previously not present subalpine and alpine habitats, which further would have driven the diversification of MOA into more and more lineages. But this is where things get interesting, because if there was just one MOA lineage in the South Island prior to this uplift, and if, as the genetics show, the North Island species are also descended from the South Island island lineage during an interval when the islands were connected, why do the aforementioned evidence of eggs indicate that Moa had speciated into at least two lineages much, much earlier than this? Basically, what I'm saying is, we don't really have any idea when Moa got here. It definitely seems to have been quite a bit more than 20 million years ago, but if they were here prior to the Oligocene dr drowning event, then only a small number of species made it through, potentially only one, which then diversified into at least one larger and smaller species, and who even knows what happened from there on out, because we just don't have any fossils. But, based on DNA evidence, all but one MOA species had died out by 5.8 million years ago, with one lineage living across the South Island. And that lineage then speciated into a spectacular diversity due to the uplift of the Southern Alps. And then within a hundred years of human arrival, the entire lineage became extinct. Which is tragic. What's not helpful here is the fact that we really don't know all that much about the ecosystems that these older MOA lived in. We don't even have evidence for any predators that they might have engaged with. So here's hoping that more fossils can help us piece together the origins of the MOA and answer questions like when did they lose their wings, what did the first MOA ancestors look like, and how did they get here? Did they fly across, or did they originate on Zealandia before it separated from the rest of Gondwana? Next time on May Moa Madness, we're going to be talking about how Moa influenced the evolution of Aotearoa New Zealand's plants. And now, for our weekly game of Rockman. Have you been hyperfixating on giant extinct birds when you should be doing work? 
Of course you have! You're a normal person! Like a normal person, you probably don't want me to take over the world. But, unlike a normal person, you have a chance to stop me. How? By stopping the rise of my secret ultimate warrior, Rockman. Rockman is a warrior made of rocks, who can be summoned by this geological phrase. Every episode on this channel, uh, apart from the last one, because I forgot, you guess a letter, and if you are correct, the letter goes on the board, and you are one letter closer to guessing the word before me and preventing the rise of Rockman. But if you guess the letter wrong, then another rock goes on Rockman, and he draws nearer to completion. Our last video bombed cataclysmically in terms of views, so we only have one upvote on our most upvoted letter for the Rockman letter. And that most upvoted letter comes from Roey Sundog, who guesses I. So, is I on the board? Every geologist already knows the answer to this. Yes! Yes, I is on the board, and it is on the board both in the first word, which has been completed, and is of course, NISOs. So, plenty of geologists will immediately know what the next word is going to be. <laughs> and, it is also on the second word. Here. It's kind of hard to see what I'm doing. I'm gonna lose Rockman now. I'm gonna lose so badly. <laughs> do you have what it takes to prevent the rise of Rockman? Of course you do. This is gonna be really easy now. So put your guess in the comments below and the most upvoted answer will either go on the board or be replaced with a rock in the next episode. In the meantime, thank you all so, so, so much for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. If you enjoy interesting topics around extinct life, then you'll love this channel. Alternatively, if you enjoy stuff about debunking pseudoscience, you'll also love this channel. I kind of try to have something for everyone who's a bit of a science nerd. A uh, huge extra special shout out to my wonderful forum tier patrons, Geneva and Iris, as well as our amazing Dilophosaurus tier patrons, Ours and Glenn Collins, and our amazing Radiolarian tier patrons, Rowan Utting and Jean and Eric Feenstra. I really appreciate just how much you guys have donated. It has helped me a lot. You are amazing, amazing human beings. In any case, I'm gonna go now. I have another God knows how many videos I'm trying to work on at the same time. Uh, so hopefully these will all be finished soon. Bye!